We, uh, we began a series last week looking at the nativity scene, and uh, we're going we're gonna to continue working through between now and really New Year's, looking at the individuals that, that make up the typical nativity scene. We've got Mary and Joseph, of course, and the angel sometimes hanging above the Koresh, usually some shepherds wise men perhaps, and of, and of course the, at the very center is Christ himself, the baby. It's a, a series that I hope brings us back home a little bit. Not just home in the feel that, that Christmas tends to bring with the, the scents and the, the dishes that we serve and the people that come to visit, but, but home for our faith that we're reminded of a couple things. One, the significance of really each individual that appears in that nativity scene. Every character, every individual represented in that scene is significant. The scriptures go to, to great detail in, in telling us a couple times, several times, who was there. So it's important for us to understand that, but but at the very heart of that, obviously, is, is the Christ child. And so my hope is that as we kind of work through the nativity scene, while, while we find maybe some encouragement in each of the individuals that we'll talk about, we, we look forward with anticipation to, to one in particular, right? Uh, we have a, a tradition in our home. I, I don't know whether our kids appreciate it or not. But we have a tradition. Several years ago, Sarah and I were in Israel, and uh, we went to a, a small shop that specialized in olive wood carvings. You can buy Bibles with olive wood covers. You can buy uh, little figurines. You can buy crosses. You can buy pretty much anything you can think of, any biblical scene. Uh, they have olive wood carvings that are just a few dollars that, that are small, and they have giant nativity scenes that stand this tall that sell for you know, like $20,000 hand-carved uh, nativity scenes. And we, we purchased what we could afford uh, at the time. Uh, we purchased three little baby Jesuses, not even the whole nativity scene, just a manger and, and an infant. And we bought one for each of the kids. And, and every year, Christmas morning, before we open any gifts, before we dig into breakfast together, uh, the first thing we do is we seek the child, like the Magi. And uh, before the kids get up, which now that they're older isn't hard to do, uh, but before the kids get up, when they were little, it was a challenge. But uh, before the kids get up, we, we take their, their little baby Jesuses and we hide them everywhere, somewhere around the house. Each of them gets tucked away into a small uh, nook or cranny somewhere. And we have one child that's very good at it. Uh, I don't know how it happens, but every year walks almost directly to the room and within, within two minutes has found uh, the Christ child. And we have one child who's terrible at finding things and usually ends up getting help from the other two. And, uh, and sometimes we have to give clues, even now, as uh, they are basically adults and still can't can't find things. So it's fun for us uh, to watch it all play out. But these traditions, these, these things that just scream Christmas to us, the nativity is one of them. And last week we talked about the Virgin Mary and her central role in this story and the fact that she ever since has probably been the, the most famous woman in, in all of human history. But there's someone else mentioned with her in the account that we read. Her fiancé, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. There he is. I hope you caught it, because that's, that's about all he gets in this story. And we're going to discover today that Joseph is maybe the most curious of the individuals mentioned in the Christmas story. I think his role is more curious, interesting than, than perhaps even the shepherds. 
these strangers, these, this ragtag group of shepherds that just kind of shows up if you've ever had uh, uninvited dinner guests and they just end up showing up and there's kind of that moment of panic. Uh, imagine that at the birth of your child. Uh, but, but I think Joseph is even more interesting for several reasons. And so this morning we're going to talk about his role. She was engaged, she was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in a couple musicals. In one of them, I had a pretty significant role. and the other, I had maybe the most insignificant role in the show, uh, or one of a couple. I was not tree number five, but I was Russian number five in the show Fiddler on the Roof. I didn't even have a name. I was just another Russian. If it was a movie, uh, I would have been considered an extra. I had no lines. Uh, probably wouldn't really have even gotten paid. It would have been an honor to have been in it. But uh, So I played a Russian in the show. It was a great role. Uh, like I said, we had no lines. There was no effort to memorize anything. We, we did sing some songs uh, as, as a chorus. There was a, the barroom scene where we flipped tables and benches and got to carry real torches. And so it, it was a lot of fun, but it was an insignificant role. Had I gotten the flu uh, the day of one of those shows, we did, I think, seven shows over uh, the, the winter break, but had I gotten the flu during the day on any one of those show days and not been able to make the show, no one save my parents would have had any clue that someone was missing, right? The show would have gone on just as it had before without Russian number five, and nobody would have been, wait, Where's the really great-looking Russian? No one would have known. It would have just been the show as normal. The only change is that my, my buddy Danny would have had to carry my bench off stage at the end of the scene. That would have been the only change. It was a completely insignificant role. Joseph plays almost that role in, in this story. Which is crazy when you realize Joseph is actually kind of a big deal. Let's go back and look at or listen to Luke chapter 1 again. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. We mentioned last week <laughs> they're from this kind of backwoods town that uh, most people haven't even heard of. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Sounds like no big deal a descendant of David. Luke makes sure that there's this parenthetical note about who Joseph is. He is somebody. He is a descendant of the great King David. <coughs> you see, Joseph is a member of the royal line. He is an heir to the throne of Israel. Joseph's a big deal. It's just that nobody knows it. In fact, if Israel had not been under the thumb of the Roman Empire, had they been a sovereign nation with their own government established and in charge, it's very likely that Joseph would have sat on the throne. He was a rightful heir to the throne of Israel in the line of King David himself. Joseph is somebody working as a craftsman in a hick town, in a region kind of to the north that nobody really knows anything about. He's somebody living out a nobody life. Luke wants us to understand the significance of this so much that he mentions it again in chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, verse 4, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. 
He is in the succession of kings. And not just any king, but he's tied directly to the greatest king that ever lived and ever ruled in the nation of Israel. Joseph, from a nowhere town, went to another small town outside of Jerusalem that would be insignificant except for the fact that that's where King David came from. And Joseph was returning, returning to his ancestral hometown as he would every year because of who he was, the house and the line of David. Now, this is such a a crazy twist to this individual who just kind of disappears into the back of your nativity, standing next to Mary, behind the Christ child, usually behind the shepherds, pushed to the front and off to the side a little bit. Not nearly as interesting as the magi with their crowns and their gifts and their camels. It's just some guy with a shepherd's crook in the back. In fact, some of you probably the shepherd's crook is broken and snapped off. And you didn't even take time to glue it back together. (laughs) Just the guy in the back. And he was in line for the throne. This, I think, is so important to us in this holiday season for this reason. Joseph was somebody living out a nobody role. And it teaches us first and foremost that, that there, is, there is a faithfulness to be adored in Joseph about his humble position within God's plan. We all want big roles, don't we? We all want significant moments in the spotlight. Maybe not if you want to be in front of people. But, but at the end of the day, you want to know that, that the life you lived, that the role you played, that the, the activities you gave yourself, that at some point, somewhere in your life, you did something of substance and significance, that it mattered at the end of the day. I did a funeral several years ago, and, and it wasn't an individual I knew very well, but, but they had three or four people speak about this individual. Every one of them said, you know, he sure liked to fish. That was it. That was all there was to say about him. And a long life. He enjoyed fishing. And I thought, whoa. I, I, hope, I hope someday when people remember me, there's, there's a little more <laughs> to be said. But you see, Joseph, even though he could have been king, was satisfied playing this humble support role. In fact, He's only ever mentioned in the scriptures one time after Jesus is a boy. The guy barely makes it out of chapters 1 and 2 of Matthew and Luke. And and we don't hear of him again. While, While Mary's fame is unparalleled in both the scriptures and in history, Joseph is almost completely forgotten. Mary's like the cranberry of of juices, right? Cranberry's in everything. Mary's in the name of schools and hospitals and churches. Her statues stand in probably 85 to 95% of all Catholic churches around the world. We have songs about her. We sing about her in our Christmas carols. How many Christmas carols mention Joseph? I looked on the internet this week. There's like four of them, and I've never heard of any of them. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even get mentioned in the songs that we sing at the, the t- this time of year. He's almost completely forgotten. The one time he's mentioned during Jesus' ministry is in Luke chapter 3. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. He was the son, so is thought, of Joseph. 
The one mention of Joseph is, yeah, a, a lot of people thought he was Jesus' dad, but he really wasn't. I mean, he kind of filled in and helped raise him. But, but this is the only mention beyond Jesus' first couple years. Like I said, we, we, all, we all desire significance in life. We, we want people to understand that, that we've contributed some way, right? We, we get upset when our kids don't get the playing time we think they deserve. We get offended for our spouses when they're overlooked for the promotion we think that they've earned. We, we get deeply wounded when when we feel like we have more to offer than, than others realize or appreciate, we, we all do this. In fact, this morning, what, what I'd like for you to do in your notes is find a, find a space on your notes and, and write down a, an, a location, <clears throat> an arena, a place in your life where you've been overlooked. You've been undervalued, unappreciated. Go ahead. Write down some place where you got pushed to the back. Where, where no one seemed to even notice your efforts. Where have you been overlooked? Where, where would a thank you have been just enough, but you went without that even. Because this is Joseph's role. Here's what I'd like you to do next. As you think about that place that you wrote down, I'd like you to ask some different questions because it's easy for us to get caught up in, in being disrespected unrecognized, underappreciated. It's easy for us to hang on to that and to feel wounded or bitter or angry about it. Or we can understand that sometimes God puts us in these significant, insignificant roles. Ask yourself these questions. How might serving in one of those positions carry a noble purpose that goes unnoticed? What noble purpose did you have in that role or with those responsibilities? Because <laughs> at the heart of it, that's, that's what makes you upset. That's what wounds you, isn't it? You can understand the significance of, of your responsibilities or your position or your decisions or your efforts. It's important to remember, what was noble about, about your part? You see, the Lord had you there for a specific reason. And it was to, to complete a task, provide a service, be available to an individual. And maybe you didn't make the cover of the playbill. Maybe you didn't get mentioned at the front of the cast list, you were just in a long list of choir members, lost somewhere in the middle. But that wasn't why you were there in the first place. There was a noble, noble purpose. Maybe, maybe you're still in that position. Maybe you're still playing that role even now, wondering if anyone notices if it's making a difference. Joseph was graceful and faithful to his position in the nativity story and in the years to follow. How, how will you and I be faithful to the responsibilities God's bestowed on us? How will we graciously accept those positions? And how will we, like Joseph, Choose to live righteously and with integrity in them. Because as we read through this story, not much is said about Joseph himself, but what little is said tells us something of his character. And it's important to be reminded that, 
that in these places where we feel like no one's noticing, that sometimes it's exactly where God wants us. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Joseph received no special blessing that we read of or, or know about. In fact, most scholars believe that Joseph likely died not long into life. Maybe as a, as a teenager, as a very young man. Because while Mary is mentioned at all these significant junctures of, of Christ's ministry, Joseph is never mentioned. His presence isn't mentioned. And so a lot of scholars believe that Joseph was probably <clears throat> somewhat older than Mary and, and maybe died early in the story. Joseph, the, the stepfather of Messiah, maybe, maybe was written out of the story early. And we think, is, is that fair? And yet, but we're reminded in the Scriptures that sometimes God... God has individuals set aside for a significant and yet brief role in the story. And so it makes us, each of us, ask ourselves, could I embrace such a role? Could I embrace a role that, that has an important piece, that, that plays a significant role, but maybe doesn't get recognized or appreciated by, by others as much? Would I give whatever the Lord needs whether it's noble or humble? Would I give the same level of effort? If, I, if I'm credited at the end and, and take a bow early on, or if I just come out with two dozen other cast members, the extras, do I give the same passion for what Jesus has asked me to do? Do I walk as boldly and confidently into uncomfortable circumstances as pleasant ones? Some, some roles are, are not as enjoyable. They're not as glamorous or glorious, and, and yet they're still important. So, so Joseph really is of, of no notoriety in history or barely any. And yet he still has a role, and he plays it beautifully. And we see the Gospels tell us of, of his, his faithfulness and his commitment to do what he was called to do. Matthew hints at this, that, that one of Joseph's main responsibilities was to stand as a, as a guard over those that God had had selected or raised up for his purposes. Joseph was a faithful protector of those God had appointed for these other roles. We have said several times that the center of the nativity doesn't belong to a cast of characters, but to one individual. The infant, the, the baby who was completely defenseless within his own creation. And one of Joseph's key roles and responsibilities was to protect the child. Matthew 1.19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Even before Jesus was born, Joseph is already playing the role of protector. When he doesn't understand what's going on with Mary, when he loves her dearly, but he finds that she's with child and he knows that the child is not his, what does he do? Because he was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He is a natural sheepdog looking to care for and protect even Mary's reputation and honor during her pregnancy. Not long after this, an angel appears to Joseph, explains to him the situation. And what's Joseph's response? And 
again, Matthew chapter 1, this time in starting with verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Again, Joseph is protecting. Joseph brings Mary into his own home as his wife. They, they speed up the engagement period. He brings her into his very home. He accepts her as his own wife. He commits to caring for her, to providing for her, to raising the child that she's now carrying, which he knows, again, is not his. He immediately obeys, even though it upends everything that he had in mind to do just, just maybe the night before. in addition to protecting her. Verse 25, he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth. Why, why does he do this? He, he brings his wife home and, and doesn't touch her for almost a year. You see, Joseph realized the significance of the virgin birth within God's story. And he would bring no question or doubt to the fact that she was, in fact, a virgin. That the child she carried was from the Holy Spirit. While he had an angel come and explain it to him, he knew that the, the, those who lived around them, his neighbors, his family members, later down the road, those that, that would hear Jesus speak and listen to his teaching— they wouldn't get the same visit from the angels. They wouldn't get the same miraculous explanation that he got. And so he made sure that he, he did everything within his power, not only to protect Mary's honor, but to protect the truth about where Jesus came from and whom he belonged to and from whom he came. Joseph said his own desires, his own needs, his own wants aside in order to protect, in order to, to protect the public understanding of who Jesus was. Matthew continues on to, to tell us about Joseph's role as protector of Mary and Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. Now, after the birth, when the Magi arrive on the scene later. When they, the Magi, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. You wonder if Joseph was like, oh, not you again. <laughs> Every time you show up, my life goes sideways. This one's no different. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. I got a phone call earlier this week from one of my kids who uh, needed some paperwork. And it was at the house. She was not there, so she called me at 1130, woke me up. I'd just fallen asleep. Kind of delirious, right? I go and I take the pictures of the, the forms that she needs and text them to her. Go back to bed. About five minutes later, ding! I'm like, oh. Thank you so much. Love you. Didn't even respond. Probably should have. <laughs> I love you too. I was so tired and out of it, I didn't even, didn't even give the thumbs up. Joseph, woken out of a dead sleep, get up and move to Egypt. Now. Verse 14, so he got up. Took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. Where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. To fulfill a prophecy from thousands of years before, when prompted, Joseph got up in the middle of the night, he grabbed his wife and his child, packed their bags, 
and left everything. Walked away from everything they knew. Their families, his small business, their neighbors, and moved to a foreign nation. And he did it. He did it to protect the child. And then a few years later, another, another blasted angel appears to Joseph in Egypt. Matthew 2, 21 to 23. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel now, when prompted that Herod had died. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. When he's moving back, it would be easy to go near Jerusalem where his family was from, but because it wasn't safe, perhaps, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Back to Nazareth, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he, that Jesus, would be a Nazarene. Joseph, throughout this story, sets his own plans, his business his desires aside to care for his wife, to protect his stepson in accordance to God's purposes. Joseph sacrificed time and time again. Like Barnabas for Saul, Joseph supported those around him. He championed their causes. He stepped in front of those who had cast doubt and ridicule. He placed himself in position to protect those that God had chosen for noble, glorious, and miraculous roles. So back to your notes, where you've jotted down places that perhaps you've not given, been given the credit you deserve. This time, maybe write down some other person in your life that you see God working in. You see incredible potential. You know that the Lord has his hand on their life. And they could use a champion, an encourager, someone to support and serve, to come alongside and, and help administrate, to protect them. Who might you encourage? Who might you serve? to know glory of your own, but simply to see the ministries of other heroes built up and accelerated. You see, in the Christmas story is an individual who, who reminds us that, that sometimes the most beautiful roles are support roles in God's story. Joseph's actions supported others. And it was because he was a man of character. He was a man of integrity. His behavior was that that it would give sacrificially for others. But the Bible also indicates here and other places that when God does something significant, he raises up people who, who possess a very special character about themselves. You see, God requires the highest levels of integrity when he is at work. Just a couple examples. In the Old Testament, when there was great famine in the, the land of Israel, and the empire of Egypt was flourishing, God placed an individual in high positions of authority and leadership in Egypt another man named Joseph. And because of his wisdom, because of his intelligence, because of the, the success that God granted him in everything he touched and everything he set his mind to and that he did, he was attractive. And a powerful, beautiful woman had desire for him. And Joseph had every opportunity to have Potiphar's wife for himself, and, and he declined. In fact, he went to jail because he resisted her. Joseph lived with a high level of integrity. And because of that, God was able to use him in powerful ways to save the Egyptian empire, 
to hold it in strength for a later time, but also to save his own people, that there would be a a haven, a sanctuary for Joseph's own family who had sold him into slavery in Egypt years before. Joseph lived with high integrity, and, and God used it. The Israelites, when they inhabited the land, promised as they returned to Canaan. God gave very specific instructions. And those who obeyed were honored and, and blessed. And those, those who refused to obey God's strict commandments for purity and righteousness and to honor His name were removed from the story. Or the artisans and craftsmen who built the tabernacle and the temples according to, to God's designs. They, they were expected to live with the highest levels of, of righteousness. In the New Testament, we, we see the same expectations given for those who, who lead within Christ's church, for pastors and elders and deacons and Timothy and Titus. These individuals are to live with high levels of integrity. God expects those in roles that are supportive to his actions and his activities to live with integrity. And Joseph was faithful to obey those regulations. Again, the the gospel writers make sure we understand this. Both Matthew and Luke mention numerous times Joseph's adherence to obeying God's laws and standards. Matthew 119, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. You see, he was, he was conflicted. The girl that he's engaged to be married to is with child outside of wedlock. And because he is faithful to the law, he's a righteous individual. He knows the child isn't hers, but he can't explain whose it is. Because he's faithful to the law, she is now not, she is not a candidate to be a righteous and godly wife. And yet he loves her so much and doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He's absolutely committed to doing what God says is right and good and appropriate. And yet he finds himself in love with this girl, desiring not to to heap abuse on her or to expose her to the, the humiliation that the public certainly will cast on her. Joseph tries to navigate because of his high level integrity through this terrible situation. And the best thing he can come up with that evening is is to divorce her quietly. We know that not long after this, he gets his first angelic visitor that changes his plans, thank goodness. But then later in the story, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. Joseph follows through on on all of of the commands and the standards that God had given his people to dedicate their firstborn before the Lord, and he does so. Several verses later, also in Luke chapter 2, when Joseph and Mary had done everything, everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Joseph is is a man of great integrity. He obeys the commands of the Lord. He does so with grace as he interacts with situations that don't make sense and individuals that, that could quickly be ostracized by those around them. More than one prophet was sent by God's people to tell his people, you are serving the Lord, you're checking all the boxes, you're doing all the things that I require, all of the, the religious practices you're observing faithfully, but your hearts are far from God and your behaviors stand in direct conflict with what God has said is, is good and appropriate for you. 
God sends messages through prophet after prophet. You're doing all the right things, but, but with the worst of attitudes. And what I really desire are hearts that are committed to living rightly. I don't want just your hands to do the right things. I want your hearts and your minds to, to think on and to focus on on that which is good and lovely, this holiday season, this obscure character in the back, this carpenter from Nazareth, who could have been king, stands as, as a meek example, as a humble example of submission and obedience. May we aspire to be like him, not drawing the light to ourselves, but to graciously step back that Christ might be glorified, that he may be worshiped, that we would defend his honor, protect his activities, that we would be faithful in obeying all of his law, that he might, might be known throughout the world by what we think, by how we feel, by what we do. That he might be worshipped and praised if never a song is written about us. God, we thank you for the child. <laughs> Our lives exist for his glory. He is the one and only. He alone deserves our praise. He alone deserves our worship. And Lord, if you have called us not to fame and glory, not to noble purposes, but to humble ones, then Father, we, we willingly, we willingly accept our position and our role. And God, we thank you for it. Father, may we not seek the praise of men but simply answer the call to give you whatever it is you have asked of us, whatever it is you might desire from us. Lord, may we, may we serve you, not for our own benefit, but for yours. And Lord, if there are those around us that have been called to serve you in ways that, that need our our encouragement or our help or our support, may we be quick to offer it. May we champion your causes through them as well. This holiday season, Father, may we have eyes to see what you're doing in us and through us and also through those around us. God, give us the resources, time, energy, finances, whatever it may be, to fully support that which you desire. May it be done in us. Amen.
Still, bring. 